salvation through childbirth. Does it mean, one, a woman's salvation can be achieved through childbirth? What if a woman does not marry? Two, or does not have children? Does it mean that she cannot be saved? Does it mean that the woman will be kept safe through childbirth? What of the thousands of women who have died in childbirth? If it is number three, then the word of God is untrue. If it is either of the first two, where is the place for the cross in the salvation process? To exercise good exegesis, we need to read chapter 2, 9 to 15 as a complete unit. DM scholar says that there was a problem in the church in that some women were despising their roles within marriage. This could not be due to local cults, chapter 1 to 9. I deal with women's dress and demeanour. As we look at our section, 2, 9 to 1, this does not appear to be speaking about the marriage situation. Verse 2, authority over a man, Andros. This verse, coupled with the rest of the section, appears to be addressing Christian marriage. A woman, G.R. Gunn, could also mean a wife. There is no difference in Greek, just as Andros can mean man or husband. Paul then goes on to use the example of Adam and Eve. As France puts it, paradigm, married couple, verse 13 to 14, our section of the text concludes with the commendation of childbearing, which is the most distinctive wifely role. In the context of marriage, it is the safest role if it functions within God's plan for the family. Verse 13 to 15, the explanation of these verses is often taken back to the creation principle. We read in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, humankind, both male and female, are given joint authority. This is a creational principle, that human beings have authority. Authority is not based on gender, but upon who they are in a relationship to their creator. Both male and female were created in the image of God. He delegated or entrusted authority to them. If we say Adam, the male, was created first, then men have authority over women. Then we have to conclude that priority in creation, order, would mean that humankind must be subject to the authority of the animal kingdom, which is nonsense. In Genesis 2 to 3, Adam was created first, but Eve was first to get tempted. If the woman is responsible for sin's entry into the world, why does Paul tell us that it was Adam? If Paul is saying in Timothy that women cannot be trusted with authority because they are more gullible, surely such an argument can only be taken back to Genesis 3. Francis argues this is an illustration of the potential danger in relationships between men and women. In Genesis 2-3, the woman took the initiative with disastrous consequences and she acted independently. Nowhere in Paul's writing does he ever use the word save with regard to physical safety or well-being. Christians are not guaranteed physical safety. Christ did not have it. Stephen did not have it. Peter did not have it. Paul did not have it. We could continue. Can I draw your attention back to the religious background of Ephesus? Marriage was despised. Childbearing was looked down upon in the pagan religion. Paul is trying to correct a perverted system of belief that had crept into the church from the surrounding religions, from the religious thinking. He wants Timothy to teach the wholesomeness of Christian marriage and family life. Remember that Artemis was the one who looked after women in childbirth. Paul is telling Timothy to teach that Christ will look after them in childbirth. Their salvation is secure in childbirth, whether they live or die. Their salvation is secure. Main sources of reference. R.T. Francis, Women in Church Membership, Paternoster Press, The Social World of First Corinthians, SPCK, Barbara Sandbrook, Lecturer in Biblical Studies at Christ for the Nations, UK. From the principal's reply, I was very disappointed and sighed at the situation. Barbara Sandbrook's article may be answered, but that's not the object of my notes today. However, here is my first response. In the book of Revelation, Ephesus is the church Jesus sent word to with a commendation because they could not bear them that were evil 
and had tried those who say they were apostles and found them liars. They had laboured patiently and not fainted for the cause and name of Jesus Christ in the city of Ephesus and suffered persecution at the hands of men. Revelation 2, 2. I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them that are evil and thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and not and hast found them liars and hath borne and hath patience and for my name's sake hath laboured now Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abandoned towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purpose in himself. Timothy was not a weak man, and contended earnestly for the faith, once delivered to the saints, and taught the sovereignty of God, predestination, election, particular redemption, and church order, which included the distinctive roles of men and women in the church. The women were subject to their own husbands, prayed with their heads covered, and kept silent in the church there would have been no trial of any woman who claimed to be apostle, as that would never have arisen. It was forbidden for any woman to teach or preach or usurp authority over the man. Any woman could not claim to be an apostle, for it was forbidden for a woman to teach and usurp authority over a man. Had a woman tried to claim she was an apostle, would have been rejected as a liar, as even men were. Diana and Artemis. The notable thing about Barbara Sandbrook's article is that she is speaking about the role of women as teachers and having authority in the church. In her reference to the temple of Diana and Artemis and the silversmith who opposed the teaching of the apostle, she outlines the prominence of the goddess Diana. She cites the legend that Artemis was horrified at the sufferings of her mother in childbirth. She now had become a deity, and all men serving in the temple of Diana were castrated. This sounds like a distortion of the historic facts relating to Eve in the Garden of Eden. It is written that God not only cursed the ground for man's sake, but spoke to Eve, saying, Because thou hast done this, in pain you shall suffer in childbearing, that her desire should be towards her husband, However, he should rule over her. In other words, as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, God turned them out of the garden, cursed the ground, so Adam would have to work by the sweat of his brow, Eve would now suffer in childbearing, and she would have a natural desire to rule her husband, but he would rule over her. This was something that God brought about. And unto the servant, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, this was a prophecy relating to how redemption would come about, namely through the seed of the woman being the child of the son of being the child, the seed of the woman, the the seed of the woman bearing the child, the son of God whose heel would be bruised at the crucifixion, but this was to crush the head of the serpent. So, in the Christian community, the Gospel speaks about relationship between men and women, children and parents, and women's role in the church. Children are to be obedient to parents, the woman not to rule the man, was not to teach or function as an elder, but learn in silence in the church. Also, 
the relationship between man and woman is compared to the relationship between Christ and his church. Christ is the head of the church, even as the man the head of the woman. It is the social it is this social conduct that is to be recognized and lived out in the Christian community that is living in the world. Such is the law of Christ. Certain men. Barbara now cites a reference to certain men creeping in unawares, and the suggestion is that certain men could mean men or women. This is a quotation from Jude and not spoken about to the Ephesian church. The word certain men in the Greek in the Greek is tinus anthropoi. The word anthropos is the generic term for man. Barbara's case does not hold water because both words for certain men in Jude 4 are in the same masculine gender. In fact, all usage of anthropos in the New Testament are in the masculine. So cannot be male or female, just male. According to Ken Matto, who wrote the foreword to this book. However, Timothy would have been full well aware that certain men had been foreordained to condemnation, just as Pharaoh and Judas and other apostates were. Jude 14. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The New International Version. This reads, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written before long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, who deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. In this version, the citation of this text of scripture is used to cast doubt on the use of the word men. It is not a quote from the majority text of scripture, as found in the authorised version of Jude verse 4, but from the unreliable Sarniaticus text brought forward by Westcott and Hort in 1844. This is not a fair argument to suggest that whenever the word man is used, we are to take it, it means men or women. The context dictates that it has reference to a man, or men, plural, and masculine. My early experience. As I have mentioned, I have written this book out of my experience and conflict with professing Christians. In my early days, I had to read the scripture and Christian books myself to learn the essential truth of the gospel myself. I soon learned that it was essential to have a reliable copy of the Bible, and it became my firm conviction and belief that the majority text or received text of the New Testament was the Word of God, and all those so-called scholars who used alternative texts, such as the Sinaiticus, the Vulgate Latin versions, to compile their New Testament were in fact leading others in error. This citation of Barbara Sandbrook in the New International Version is just such a case. Likewise, Jehovah Witnesses do just the same. They produce their own New Testament from selecting parts of corrupt manuscripts to compose their New World Translation. 